Really quick before we jump into the news, I know a lot of you have been waiting for my Kobo V Kindle video. I was about 85% done with it on the final pass through of editing when Kobo announced they released a whole bunch of new e-readers and I did not want that video to be outdated on release. So I now have one of the updated e-readers and will be restarting with the whole experience. I'm sorry about the delay though. Last week, if you missed it, we did a whole new skit, a fallout review and my Sunny to review that I put out last week is probably my most personal review ever. Ever. So check out any of those if you have not already. And now into the fantasy news with quite possibly my biggest welcome ever. <sighs> Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we have a light-headed and blurry-eyed episode of Fantasy News to jump on into, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and kick it off with some cover reveals, starting with the cover from Andrea Stewart for her upcoming book, The Gods Below. Delightfully for this one, instead of doing a blurb, there was a photo release that just had a bunch of like the keyword searches for this book. So I'll just go ahead and let you know that this book indeed does contain a little bit of body horror as a treat, a deadly tournament, sinkholes. Okay, fine, I'll fight God. Grumpy winged man, touch her and you die. And by her, I mean this feral cat. Well, it's all about marketing. And as you can see, two feisty snakes on the cover. And I'm unfortunately going to have to say here, by default, I do not like this cover. I know, I'm so sorry. I just have a visceral hatred of snakes. Like, so deeply ingrained in me. It's like my one huge fear in life. Sharks, swam with them, fine. Snakes, stay the fuck away from me. And uh, for that reason, not a fan, though the art style, quite nice. I can't even look at that cover, we're moving on. And from here, we also had Harper Voyager in celebration, supposedly, of season two of House of the Dragon, releasing a limited edition of Blood and Fire with gold foil, stunning in paper. Screw this, I don't care about that. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about my book because the cover I really wanna show you is for my newest release and that is going to be a combination of my first two books rewritten, re-edited, and re-released through Wraithmark Creative. That's right, I've learned a lot since I published books one and two in the Lawful Time series, so I sat down, plugged away, and handed them on over to Wraithmark to put those two books together in one so you can get a deluxe edition, and this will be the definitive edition moving forward as well. It's going to be launching on Kickstarter in a couple of weeks here, and do not worry if you backed the Neon Ghosts Kickstarter. If you did, you probably have seen that in the next couple of weeks, it'll be on your doorstep. We've already started shipping them out. Ah, months ahead of schedule. This spectacular compendium of the first two books also is going to feature a bunch of interior art you're seeing on screen now. And that interior art is just as brutal and magnificent as I could have wanted it to be. And 100% of my proceeds are going to charity. Because I've already released these books before, I decided, hey, if I'm putting out a definitive edition, I'm just gonna make it something that the goblins can take part in and know that they're contributing to a good cause. So 100% of my proceeds are going to be going to a charity you all are going to help me choose here on the channel. Love that. There is a whole lot more for me to show off, but I'm gonna hold back, slowly dole it out until the Kickstarter officially goes live May 7th, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so much, and if any reviewers would like an advanced reader copy to compare or just do your own review of, feel free to reach out. Next news. Now we're going to be shifting gears on over to adaptation news, and one that I'm pretty excited for because it seems that Edgar Wright is moving forward with his adaptation of The Running Man, and he has cast Glenn Powell as his star. For those of you who don't know, Running Man, pretty well-known book from Stephen King, previously had an adaptation starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Ow be back only in a rerun. That did not live up to the book, in my opinion. And Edgar Wright is a heck of a pick to do a Stephen King adaptation. And I'm hoping this can join the list of Stephen King adaptations that are heralded as amazing films. Green Mile, Shawshank Redemption, Cujo, not necessarily, man, that one's good. And for those of you who are a little bit confused of why you see the name Richard Bachman here, that is a pen name that Stephen King used to publish under because he apparently wasn't already publishing enough at the time. But now we need to shift gears into 
to the wider fantasy news because to my amazement, utter shock, stupefying me in my seat, the Jon Snow spinoff of Game of Thrones has officially been canceled. Who could have seen this coming? I mean, a Jon Snow show? It even kind of rhymes a little bit there. So like this should have been, I mean, bigger than Game of Thrones. I'm amazed that in the dozens of different Game of Thrones spinoff ideas that have been shat out in the last couple of years, the Jon Snow show doesn't make the top? I'm flabbergasted. I'm going to go change my shirt. I think I got my point across. Now, I do not mean to come across like a Game of Thrones hater. I'm a big fan of what they're doing with House of the Dragon. But for this IP to recover, in my opinion, it needs to be lean and focused. And that just tidal wave of spinoffs and possible <laughs> we got in the wake of the last season of Game of Thrones arguably did nearly as much damage as the ending season eight as well. I'm not saying it did as much. I'm just saying for like the focus of the fandom and the general confusion. I get if you're someone who goes to like the Game of Thrones subreddits every day, you're probably up to date. But your average Joe is probably so lost for what's to come next. I've met people who don't even know House of the Dragon is on air yet. All of this to say, I actually think this is good news. I think they should cancel all those things that were just promised and, you know, early development. Is this a good idea? Get rid of them. Wipe the slate clean. You have another success in House of the Dragon and be very, very careful with what comes after that. But that brings us to covering the success of the Fallout show. The fallout of the Fallout show, if you will. Sorry, it just like had to be said. And that is because we have seen Fallout 76 break its all-time steel concurrent peak thanks to this show. I'm sorry for the people who are realizing that is not the best Fallout game. But aside from that, the Fallout show has continued to garner a impressive resume of rock solid reviews. And I even wish that I had been a little bit nicer in my own. I stand by what I said, like in the general outside sense of the formula of the show, it's a little bit formulaic, but it does so much personality wise and in the details to elevate the story and just overall raw entertainment value of what's brought to the screen. I'm a big fan. If you haven't checked it out already, I got a spoiler free review or just go watch it. Especially after learning Ella Purnell is the voice of Jinx. I'm really excited to see not only the future of this show, but that actress's career within the fantasy sci-fi space. Also didn't realize they were British until I just watched an interview with them. That is shocking. Great American accent. Oi, blimey. Nope, not gonna do that. The only negative I have to add about Fallout success is how much bigger I feel like it could have been if it was released weekly instead of all at once. I know some people are not with me on this. I get it, that's fine. But I really think a lot of shows grow, do better over time for a longer time because people talk about it with their friends. And if you hear two of your buddies talking about their two episodes into a show, you're likely to catch up. Whereas if everyone's just one week, pop, watched Fallout, I feel like they're more likely to just flash and fizzle. And so I'm hoping that Prime doesn't continue to do this, and I don't know why they suddenly changed it from what they're doing for the boys and Wheel of Time. And then possibly the final bit of Baldur's Gate 3 news we'll ever cover here. But that was a lie too. In terms of how it relates to the awards it receives, Baldur's Gate has officially surpassed Elden Ring and Breath of the Wild to become the first ever game to win all five major game of the year awards. Think of it as winning like a gaming equivalent of an EGOT. And if you do not know what an EGOT is, read a book aside from a fantasy sci-fi. Oh, we could do a fantasy book about winning an EGOT. Like someone who uses Matt. That's a... Don't steal my idea, moving on. But just to list them off, yes, Baldur's Gate 3 has officially received Game of the Year from the Golden Joysticks, the BAFTAs, the Game Developer's Choice, DICE, and the Gaming Awards. And it is the first game to ever do so. Is it the greatest game ever made? No, but it's really, really great. And my personal favorite. But if you're wondering like objectively, what is still the greatest game of all time? Super Mario Brothers 2! But before we get into some wild news, a quick word from today's sponsor. My precious. Meteorite rings four billion years old. Whiskey barrel rings made of durable timber. Dinosaur bone rings to have and to hold. Titanium rings to shine and shimmer. From the land of Thorum, shipping free worldwide. Just kidding, guys. It's me. 
being weird. And I wanna give a big thank you to today's sponsor, Thorum. Now that I have someone here who actually makes my wardrobe look pretty decent, one of the things that I've been wanting to do is find accessories that don't look like a high school class ring or a medieval sigil, if you know what I'm saying. And that's where Thorum has found themselves to be a perfect fit. My personal favorite and the one I've been wearing a lot the last couple of weeks is the Meteosaur. Why is it called that? Because it actually has a bit of meteor and dinosaur bone in it. That, that this is the closest thing we'll ever get to a real life dragon ring. I, that's, I chose it for a very specific reason. Dino and that's where they specialize, having rings made from fascinating materials like meteorite, whiskey barrel, ironwood, dinosaur bone, Damascus steel, World War II rifle stocks, and so many more. And if you don't know your size, don't worry, they can take care of you on the website with their paper printable ring sizer. And with over 10,000 five-star reviews, mine included, and excellent customer service, we're really happy to have them as a friend of the channel. As Kayla already said, they have free worldwide shipping and all of their rings ship out in one single business day. They also come with free silicone activity bands, an American whiskey walnut ring box, and a lifetime warranty. So whether you're looking for a wedding ring, anniversary ring, head over to thorum.com and use code DANIEL15 to get 15% off a truly unique piece. That's T-H-O-R-U-M.com using code D-A-N-I-E-L-1-5. But recently here on Fantasy News, I've been trying to find some more alternative, strange stories to add a little new spice to the fantasy news and I'm very happy to say that this week I have done so. And that is because a $300,000 Lego heist has been foiled by a retail task force, which I did not know was a thing until now. As any parent or just person who still enjoys putting together a Lego set as like a meditative hobby knows, Lego sets have gotten insanely expensive, apparently to the point where now criminals are taking note. Ugh. All right, good. Is that all of it? No, don't forget we got these too. Four individuals were arrested and charged with organized retail theft, grand theft, and conspiracy to commit crime in relation to a series of planned out thefts that over time reached a grand total of over $300,000. So, you know, like 10 Lego sets. I want my cut. Very well. And notably, this is not the first time we have seen a larger organized crime approach aimed at nerdyish media. This has happened with Pokemon cards, Magic the Gathering cards, and now Lego. Maybe it's some kind of prestigious award, or it just means this stuff's getting wildly expensive. I'll let you all decide. Late stage capitalism's great, but if you'd like to settle the fantasy news with something a bit more standard for what we'd cover, Heroes, the smash hit Season 1 show of the early 2000s is looking to get an official reboot. And while I'm kind of tired of seeing reboots, this one feels very appropriate. If you do not know the longer story of the Heroes franchise, season one was released to near universal critical acclaim and was one of those like lost era shows that seemed to be on the cutting edge of what television could evolve to be. And in the time since then, we've seen television evolve to be more like what the bar Heroes set and lost was at. But after its first season, Heroes saw a drastic downturn in perceived quality because of an ongoing writer's strike in Hollywood, of which, of course, I totally support at the time. I was like 12, but sure, did end up tanking this specific show. And so having it get a second attempt, a reboot, that seems like something cool. And we're still definitely in the era of twisted superheroes being popular now that we're kind of at the tail end of the actual superhero monolith era. It's, it's a nice little reaction to it. Seems like a good time to do so. So I'm actually pretty excited for this, especially because I only ever watched the first season of Heroes and didn't get tainted by the downfall afterwards. And I'm interested to see not only how well they'll be able to revitalize the concept, but update it for current times. Now that we're in the post Heroes, but like move, you know, like Marvel DC era. I have a little bit less faith in this after looking into it, mainly because there was apparently something already called Heroes Reborn that was trying to reboot the franchise and not very well received despite having the same original creator attached. On top of that, just because something was once considered boundary pushing television doesn't mean it's going to have aged well or hit an audience now in anywhere close to the same way. And finally, if the Writers Guild wants to pull off the funniest joke of all time, 
<laughs> not really, but this seems like a good excuse for us to go ahead and transition to seeing a self-published book from within the Goblin Horde from one of you all. And today's indie pub promo is Intersection by Colin Switalski, book one in the Children of Gamora series, pitched as a novella intended for adult audiences that incorporates horror elements while grappling with humanity at its darkest, set in a fictional city in our modern world where paranormal and supernatural entities lurk in the shadows. Aiden Reeves is going to die. At least that's what the whispers tell him. The darkness of the early morning envelops him as he drives down the open road, consumed by a deep sense of frustration and disappointment. Just when he thinks things couldn't get worse, fate throws him a curveball in the form of a near-death experience. The possibility of never seeing the light of day again forces him to confront the harsh realities of his life and mortality. <laughs> This has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. I am your lightheaded, disheveled goblin. Like and subscribe if you have not already, and be sure to check out Thorum, and thank you for sponsoring today's video. My books, Neon Ghosts, are currently available, and soon you'll be able to get the deluxe edition of the Lawful Time series. Have a good one, y'all. Love you. Bye!